All right, good morning. Welcome to Grace Church. Uh, welcome to our equipping hour. I'm Slade. Hello. Good to see all of you this morning. Uh, welcome. Um, so yeah, we're continuing our series talking about heart work. Uh, biblical counseling, um, kind of applying the Bible, the gospel to our lives, and helping others do the same. This is week five, and today we're talking about biblical anthropology, or identity, right? Who we are, right? Answering those questions. Who am I? Who we are? What is my identity? What are we as people? So two main things. We're going to um, talk about how the world tries to answer this question about identity, who we are. And then we're going to talk about how the Bible answers this question. Um, And then maybe why that's important. We'll probably get to that. Alrighty. That's where we are. Any, how is everybody? Everyone doing okay? Doing good? Having a good week? Thumbs up? Okay. Good. Uh, Let's pray, and then we can get started. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Uh, We ask you to be with us this morning. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We need you, Lord. Come dwell with us today in this place. Magnify your presence. Um, Convict our hearts. Convict our minds and draw us to you. Draw us to our knees. Help us to worship you. To worship you well this morning. Be with us as a church. Uh, Help us to seek you in all that we do. Be with me this morning. Help help me to speak clearly and truthfully. Um, Let your word be proclaimed. We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, so far in our class, we've talked about a few different things. Again, I said this is week five, so we've had four weeks previous. Um, we've defined what biblical counseling is, which is helpful. That kind of gives us an idea of where we're going. Uh, applying biblical and gospel principles to our lives and the lives of others. Uh, we've talked about what the Bible is, right? That it's divine, that it's human, um, that it's inerrant, uh, that it's authoritative, We've talked about what the gospel is, right? Who God is and uh, the fall and our our fate as sinners, where we find ourselves now, uh, the glory of the grace of of God and Jesus Christ and his death and burial and resurrection and the hope we have in him. Last week we discussed how the Bible is better than uh, psychology, why that is. Uh, We can talk more about that if you have questions. Uh, But today we're going to talk about the subject of anthropology, anthropology. Uh, the word anthropology is a combination of two Greek words. Anthropos and is a Greek word that means human, mankind, humanity. Uh, that's what that means. And ology, of course, means to learn or to study. Common. So anthropology is the study of mankind, right? Who we are, where we've been, what we've done, and where we're going. Today we're interested both in kind of the universal focus of what that means, right? what it means to be human in general, and the specific focus of who you are, who I am. Both important uh, things to look at and to discuss. So that brings me kind of to a question for all of you. How would you answer the question, who are you? And feel free to yell at me. Think about it for a second. Shout at me some answers. How would you answer the question, who are you? Yeah, first reaction is good. Maddie, okay. Your name, right? Your name. That helps define you, right? That's your identifier. Great. Any other thoughts? That that works as well. Parent. Parent. Absolutely, parent. Yeah. Sorry? A role that you have, exactly. Something you do, right? Something you fulfill, right? Anything else? What? Image bearer. Image bearer. Okay. A biblical idea of what, so what someone has said about you, right? About who you are. Great. Any other thoughts? No? Okay. Well, we're going to dive into that more. Great, great answers all around. Um, first, we're going to talk about how the world defines our identity. How the world defines our identity. There are roughly four ways that we look at how the world or the culture everything around us defines our identity, tries to answer this question. Who are you? Who am I? The first is our background. Our background. Uh, This can be where we're from, our family, our geography, 
our culture, our name, right? our history, background things about us. It's not uncommon to hear people say, I'm a Texan or I'm an American, right? I'm from the East Coast or the West Coast. I'm from France. Uh, perhaps people um, kind of have different cultural things they say, like, oh, in my family, we don't celebrate Halloween, right? Or perhaps they say, I've never, we talked about this before, I've never heard of candy corn, and that's something about their history, right? They don't know what that is, which is a tragedy because candy corn is amazing. Um, we can fight about that later if you disagree. Um, in terms of kind of the wide picture of humanity, our background is our history, right? When you think of anthropology, this is normally what we talk about, right? If you go study a class, to study different tribes and different histories and archaeology, and we look at kind of what human beings have been before, right? The rise and fall of civilizations and groups and movements, uh, many other things like that, our background. This is one way we kind of tend to define ourselves, the world does. The second way is by what we do. Right? Our occupation, our roles, our hobbies, by what we do. And this is often the first thing we think about next, kind of after our name. Uh, when we meet people, we often say, hello, my name is Slade, and I am X. Right? I'm an accountant, or a teacher, or a student. Uh, I'm a programmer, a pineapple salesman, right? an assistant associate regional director of sales and marketing, or whatever, kind of corporate speak we define our roles as, right? And I have one of those titles as well at my work, so, yeah. Um, what we do, our occupations. We may also define ourselves by our hobbies, right? What roles we play as a parent, uh, as, a, as a son or a daughter, right? Or maybe things we like to do, right? I, I'm a hiker, right? Or um, I'm a college football fan, or I'm a collector of whatever you collect, vinyl records like Michael, or stamps, or whatever, I don't know. Whatever people collect, toys. Whatever we do, right, this is one way that we tend to define ourselves, and the world tends to define ourselves. Number three, we often define ourselves, or the world does, by what others say about us, what others say about us. If someone says, you know, something positive or negative, right? If someone says we're pretty or we're ugly, or someone says we're dumb or we're smart or friendly or mean or whatever it may be, how others view us and what they say about us often affects how we answer this question, right? If we grew up in a positive kind of household and we were, we were told that, you know, we can do things and you're smart and all that sort of stuff, that affects how we think about ourselves. We think about ourselves as smart. Or perhaps someone said to you something very mean one time about who you are. And that stays with you, right? And that affects how you think about yourself. Last week, we talked about psychology, right? And psychology often tells us, as humans, how we should believe about ourselves, right? We learn that, and we are told, that humans are biological only, right? That we are only slightly smart animals and nothing more. Or perhaps we learn that we have some kind of labeled condition, right? We're told we have... Uh, ADD or OCD or something like that. We're told these things about, our, about ourselves, right? So what others say about us affects how we understand our identity. And number four, the world defines our identity by what we say to ourselves, what we say about and to ourselves. Everyone talks to themselves, right? Uh, ter uh, Paul Tripp in his book, it's this one right here. This is kind of the basis for the class if you're interested in instruments in the Redeemer's hands. But he says this about this idea. No one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. You are in an unending conversation with yourself. You're talking to yourself all the time, interpreting, organizing, and analyzing what's going on inside of you and around you. You are constantly involved in an internal conversation that greatly influences the things you decide to say and do. All right? We talk to ourselves all the time. We do this um, sometimes when things are wrong. We tell ourselves, right? So we do something wrong. We tell ourselves, oh, you screwed up, right? You can never get it right. Or sometimes we do something great and we think, oh, I'm the best, right? No one can beat me, right? And we do this back and forth to ourselves all the time. Maybe we get cut off in traffic twice in a row and all of a sudden we say, 
well, everyone is just terrible at driving, which may or may not be true. But we say that to ourselves, right? We, we make these assumptions this, and these ideas and we tell ourselves these things that we tend to believe. Now, all four of these things can be true and they can be helpful, right? They can be helpful for us to better understand kind of our strengths and weaknesses, who we are, where we come from, what we're about, what our identity is. On the other hand, they can be false, right? We can believe untrue things that people say or about our background or about what we do, right? They can confuse us and lead us down wrong paths, sinful thoughts, sinful actions. That, why, that is why it is very important we believe true things about who we are and we conform everything else to those truths. Right? The truth is keying here. And we're better to find the true answers than the word of God. So those things are kind of what the world kind of and the culture tells us what define us, right? what our identity is. And we're going to talk about a little bit about what the Bible says about who we are. What the Bible says about who we are. Our next main kind of subject. Because we know that the Bible is divine, right? We've talked about this previously, previously when we talked about the Bible. Um, we said it is both inerrant and it is authoritative. We know that what it says is both true and should guide our thoughts and actions. Thankfully, the scripture speaks quite a lot about who we are as people. I want to talk about just three things that the Bible says we are. Just three. First, the first thing that it says is that we're creatures made in the image of God. Creatures made in the image of God. And there's two parts to kind of this definition. First, the creature part, and second, the image of God part. So if we look at Genesis 1, um, there's a lot to show us here. Right? It shows us the truth of who we are, and it gives us insights into what this means. So, first thing, because humanity is made in God's image, humanity is special and valuable right, is unique among all creation. Nothing else bears God's image in all of creation. It's important to hold on to. Next, we see that after um, God makes Adam and Eve, he does something that he doesn't do with any of the other creatures or creation or any other part of it. Not only does he give us the image, but he speaks to them. God speaks to them. God tells Adam and Eve who they are and what their job is, right? He talks to them. He reveals something to them. And this is kind of amazing when you think about it. In this one act, God um, shows that humanity can both receive and understand revelation from him, right? And that it, we need revelation from him, right? We can receive and understand revelation, and we also need revelation. We as humans are able to heal, hear from God, receive what he says, think about it, Analyze it, process it, interpret it, understand it. This is part of being God's image, right? We can think, interpret, and understand. We receive revelation from God. But along with this, uh, this truth is that we are able to. Um, it also shows that we need revelation from God. Even though Adam and Eve were perfect people living in a perfect relationship with God, they could not figure out life on their own. They were created to be dependent, right? And this is not uh, the cause of, because of sin or any other problem, right? We are created to be dependent. We are dependent creatures. We need God and we need his direction, his revelation. We are not like some tree in the ground that has no thoughts or doesn't need to know what to do, right? A tree just does its thing, right? We as people, we need to think and receive from God. But at the same time, we are dependent upon him for direction and for life. Uh, this aspect of humanity is what Tripp calls revelation receivers, right? We are revelation receivers. We receive from God. So Genesis 1 teaches us that we are special, that we are valuable, that we are revelation receivers, that we can understand what God has to say and we need to have and hear from God and understand what he is saying. So that's the first one. We are creatures made in the image of God. That's who we are. The second thing the scripture tells us about who we are, it shows us that we are sinners. We are sinners. So right after Genesis 1, we have Genesis 3. Well, Genesis 2, and then Genesis 3. All right, it shows us what went wrong 
Adam and Eve used the ability they had, the ability God gave them to understand and interpret revelation and to think and receive communication, right? And they interpreted the, the wrong thing, right? They received information and revelation from the wrong person, the serpent, and believed it. And this led them astray. They went from depending on God, right, to trying to be independent of God, right? From worshiping God to worshiping themselves. Something that they were not made to do, right? We were not made to be independent. And so when we try to be independent, it throws everything off, right? And that's what sin does. So here we find ourselves as humans, as sinners. What does this mean for our identity, right? If we are sinners, what does it mean? It means that the image of God in us has been marred, right? It's been changed. It's been corrupted. It means that we are under the judgment and the effects of sin and God's wrath, right? Sin requires wrath and judgment, and so we stand under those truths. It means also that we are separated from God and also separated from our true selves, the image has been marred in us. We are under judgment. We are separated from God and from ourselves. This is the place we all find ourselves. Sinners, separated from God, deserving of judgment. That's the second thing the scripture teaches us about who we are. Thankfully, there's a third thing. Right? The third thing is that the Christian is redeemed. Right? That's the next thing the scripture teaches us about who we are. The Christian is redeemed. The New Testament teaches us that if we repent and believe in Christ, we are redeemed. We are no longer under the judgment and the righteous wrath of God. We are justified. We are no longer separated from God, but reconciled to him by the blood of Christ. Galatians 2, and 23 says, But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, right? We return back to being dependent on God, right? No longer slaves to ourselves, worshiping self, slaves to sin. We now become slaves to God, dependent on him, worshiping him, focused on him, the place where we should have been all along. In Christ, we reject our false independence and cling to the, our true selves as dependent Revelation receivers of God. We know the truth of who we are, as the scripture reveals, is better than any answer that the world or culture tries to give. Right, so this is better, right? What the Bible says is true, right? And it is better than the rest, than the rest of these things that we tend to cling on and tend to hold to as part of our identity. Paul says in uh, Philippians 3, 4 through 8, he says this. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Paul was trying to understand himself, right? And who we are. He's trying to describe, you know, righteousness in the law versus the goodness of Christ. But here we also have an idea he lists all these things about himself, right? He lists kind of his history, his backstory. Um, he lists where he's from, kind of his, his merits, what he thinks about himself. He used to, right? He used to think he was great. What other people thought of him, right? A Pharisee, right? His occupation, all these ideas. So he's listing all these ideas of these ways he's defined himself in the past. And other people have defined him, right? His identity, right? And then what does he say? All of this can be thrown away because of the glory of knowing who Christ is. Our identity in Christ is so much greater than any of the other things we claim to identify ourselves with. Our history, our past, what we do, who people say we are, what we say we are, none of that matters in the light of who Christ is and our identity in him. I 
the truth that we are creatures made in God's image and sinners, that we are deserving of wrath, yet given eternal life, saved in Christ by the infinite love and grace of God, adopted as sons, part of his body, the bride of Christ, deserving of wrath, yet given eternal life. This truth is so great that all the other things in comparison are rubbish. Right? Our identity in Christ is our most important identity. All right. Now, why is this important? Right? Why is it important we talk about this idea, this uh, idea of who we are, um, what defines us, right? what the, the difference between the understanding what the world does and what the Scripture does? First, it's important because a false belief of who we are is at the root of many of our problems. Right? It's at the root of many of our problems, false belief in who we are. And we have an identity problem, right? We, you just look around, you can see it. Everyone's trying to figure out who they are. And they're running to different things, different activities or events or people or ideas to try to figure that out, right? It's, it's, it's part of us, right? We wanna, there's something missing. We, we for, we've forgotten who we are, right? And that's because we've separated from the one who tells us who we are, right? There's something wrong. And so this is important. I've quoted before that every counseling problem is a misunderstanding of God and of man. So this idea who we are is fundamental to our understanding of our problems, right? And how we should go about fixing them. So that's why it's important. Second reason it's important is because, as Tripp says in his book, that the power of sin has been broken, but the blinding presence of sin remains, right? In other words, Christians still find ourselves in a difficult position in life. Sin still has a presence in our world and in our hearts, we forget, right? Even as Christians, we know that we are sons and daughters of God, forgiven, redeemed, dependent on Him. We forget, right? We return to the old ways. Sin still has a presence in our worlds and in our hearts, right? We need encouragement. We need reminders and help, comfort, accountability, community, right? Sometimes chastisement, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says this. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil and unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Right? And this helps us understand kind of what we need to do together and why we're talking about uh, biblical counseling in general, right? We sin and we have an unbelieving heart and that leads us to fall away from Christ. And so we need to be encouraged. We need to be reminded of who we are, right? Where we've been, what God says about us um, because we forget so often. We forget so often. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments? Yes, sir. We talk about identity. Mm -hmm. like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have a sense of identity. We're, we're all mixed together. We're all looking for something. And it's, it's almost like God is, is using that as a perfect soil for the church to come in and say, here's your identity. Yeah. You're citizens of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And that's like right now when everyone's looking for, well, I'm cisgender, blah, 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 or I'm LGBT, whatever. Sure. Yeah, and that's, that's a great point. Uh, as a great point is uh, um, the, the evangelistic opportunities that the lack of people's understanding of who they are presents to us. 
Right here we're talking about biblical counseling, which is for the church and for the Christian, which is great. But you're absolutely right. There is an evangel evangelistic component that we can provide, right? Because we have the truth, a world who is stuck in falsehood, confused, um, disoriented, right? Trying to figure out who they are and finding it in all kinds of crazy ways. Um, it's an opportunity for the church to come in and and provide and show people what the truth is. This is who you are. You are a sinner, right? Made in the image of God. Repent and believe and remember who we should be, right? Dependent upon God. And that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who are you really supposed to be? And Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's talk about homework for a second. If you've been here, we've been giving homework. Last week I gave four questions um, to kind of give us an idea and talk about kind of issues we're having or problems. Um, hopefully, that's just really to get our minds in the right kind of method and the right idea. Next week that we're going to actually use those. So we're going to kind of work at a heart, kind of a heart worksheet and how kind of dealing with problems. Um, so we'll talk about next week. Hold on to that. Um, for this week, um, I want you to write down an answer to the question of who I am. Make sense? It doesn't have to be long. It can be short. Um, and uh, you can include kind of normal stuff that we might, cultural things, world things, that's fine. Horizontal things, you might say. Write your name and what you do and that kind of stuff. That's fine. Right, but I do want you to make, uh, pay particular attention to the vertical, right, the biblical idea, biblical identity of who you are, because um, that's the most important, um, and it's the most true, the most accurate. Um, so, and do it in your own words, right? You don't have to use words I said. In fact, it might be better not to, um, but kind of dive in, kind of write down who you are, right? I'm this person, and this is who I am in Christ, and this is kind of where I am and where I'm going, so on and so forth. Um, and that's going to be helpful as we, um, as we keep going, as we move on in our study. Next week, we're going to dive right in. We're finally getting into the heart, right? Why it's the heart that needs change, um, kind of talking about situations versus what's inside of us. And we're going to do a little worksheet between and some analogies and talking about that kind of stuff. So that's, we're finally getting to the meat of it. Sorry, it took me five weeks to kind of Lay, lay groundwork, but if you've been coming, you know that's, I like background information. So, we're finally there, so be excited. Um, that is all I have. Um, thank you so much, I appreciate you all. Um, if you have questions, comments, come talk to me, and I'd love to chat, uh, and we'll see you next week.